Greetings from Columbia Business School Executive Education. My name is Scott Gardner, and I'm here today with Steve Martin for today's webinar, Using Behavioral Science to Influence Change in Your Business. Before I introduce Steve, I'd like to just go over a few quick logistics. If you look at the next slide, a recording of this webinar will be emailed to you. If you'd like to tweet about this webinar, please do so at hashtag CBSExecEd. Finally, most importantly, please submit those questions to the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of those as possible in the last 10 minutes. It's my pleasure to introduce Steve Martin. He is the faculty director of the upcoming Behavioral Science in Business live online program at Columbia Business School Executive Education. His work applying behavioral science to business and public policy has been featured in national and international press, including BBC TV and radio, The Times, Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, Harvard Business Review, and Time Magazine. He is a Royal Society nominated author and has written multiple books, including Yes, Secrets from the Science of Persuasion, a New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Business Week bestseller, as well as his latest book, Messengers, Who We Listen To, Who We Don't, and Why. Steve, it's great to be with you today. Well, thanks very much indeed, Scott. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, a pleasure always to uh, speak about this topic of behavioral science uh, at Columbia Business School. Let me start by asking you to consider these three challenges. You're a transport operator and you need to reduce the number of near misses and accidents amongst your bus drivers. You're a climate change organization and you want to encourage people to engage in pro-environmental behaviors like choosing greener options, reducing carbon emissions and eliminating animal trafficking. And you're a debt manager who wants to persuade their customers to agree and stick to an affordable repayment plan. The first thing that should strike you about each of these three challenges is that at their very core, they are people problems. The way in which we overcome this particular set of challenges is to think about how we can influence and persuade and affect human behavior. And when we think about the best ways to do that, often we'll default to one of two positions. We'll think that either in order to affect change, we need to give people some more information that will inform them into some sort of change, or we think about an incentive, a way in which we can essentially incentivize people to move in a certain direction, or we put penalties in place to disincentivize them. Now, these are really, really important when it comes to the topic of influencing and changing behavior. But the one thing that is often missing from these two default positions is an understanding of how us humans actually react to information and incentives. And if all we do is think about incentives and information in an isolation, we've kind of got like a two-legged stool. And two-legged stools, as we know, tend to be a little bit flaky. They're not particularly well balanced. They're not robust. So we need a third leg in order to kind of create a more solid platform for our change programs to likely take effect. And I'm going to argue that that third leg is this idea of behavioral science. So what exactly is behavioral science? Well, behavioral science is essentially a collection of insights and key models from disciplines like psychology, specifically social and cognitive psychology, behavioral economics, and increasingly neuroscience. And what behavioral scientists do is they use these insights to understand, to predict, and figure out strategies and plans of action that successfully, effectively, ethically, and sustainably influence human behavior. Now, I'd like to talk today in the short time we have together about two of the most basic models or insights from behavioral science that we all use when we start to think about how we can affect change. The first concerns thinking, and the second concerns this idea of engines of change. So let me take both of these in turn. And first, let's talk about thinking. Now, there's a sum now on the screen, and immediately you saw this sum 
an answer came to mind, the answer four. You didn't have to call it out. Your brain offered it up to you in a matter of milliseconds, almost instantaneously. And this is a good example of what behavioral scientists refer to as fast thinking. The idea that we have one brain, but we have two ways principally of thinking about and processing information. One is fast, it's unconscious, it's automatic. It's the system one part of our brain that is always turned on. It's reflexive in nature and it allows us to quickly come up with answers when we see sums like two plus two. Now take a look at this. In this instance, an instant answer doesn't come to mind. This is what we would think about in terms of a system two type of processing or thinking. It's slower, it's ponderous, it needs to process information in sequence, it's controlled. It requires us to activate that type of thinking. It uses glucose, it uses energy. It's a kind of often lazy part of our thinking. And so when we think about behavioral science and when we think about communicating and positioning our information, our education, our incentive-driven challenges, it can be helpful to be thinking about what part of our thinking are we talking to when we're communicating? Are we talking to that more rational, ponderous, slow thinking type of uh, processing in our brains? Or are we actually presenting to our audiences information that enables them to process it quickly? Are we essentially talking to system one or are we talking to system two? And it's a really, really important part of any behavioral science thinking. We want to make it as easy as possible for people to be able to engage with, process, and attend to the informations and the propositions that we are presenting to them. So that's one type of model, if you like, that behavioral scientists use, a pretty basic one. Here's another one. It's this idea of engines of change. If we want to get someone to change, be it an individual, a department, a whole community of people, it's really, really important that we think about these specific engines of change, the things that are going to be catalysts to us being able to affect and make sure that our programs are successful. So the first is to think about, does our audience have the ability to undertake the changes or the requests that we're making of them? Secondly, would they intend to do that if they actually had the time, the energy to think about all the different possibilities? We want to ensure that the strategies of change that we put in place are consistent with what people would want to do and intend to do. We, won't, we don't want to manipulate people. We certainly don't want to be using these insights in immoral or unethical ways. And finally, are our changes, the strategies that we're putting together, aligned to fundamental human motivations? And I want to speak to those motivations for a few moments. So consider for a few moments, if you would, a light system. If I switch on the wall light by flicking that switch on the wall, the lights go on. Now, does the switch provide power? No, it doesn't. What it does is it connects a circuit. The power is already installed in the system. What the switch does is it releases that energy. And it's a good analogy, I think, for thinking about motivations. All of us have a limited number of fundamental motivations that drive us to behave in certain ways. And if we can figure out the right switch to activate these motivations, that gives us a very powerful set of tools to think about how we can create strategies of change. Now, it turns out when you look at the research, there are really only a small number of fundamental motivations that are universal to all of us. There are three, in fact, that we find are most successful in underpinning successful change. The first is accuracy. All of us in this volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world need ways in which we can make accurate, quick, efficient decisions without necessarily having to take on board all the information and learn everything about the particular context. We need cues for accuracy. And anything that enables us to make those quick, accurate decisions is like found gold for us. Secondly, 
All of us are motivated to behave in ways that allow us to connect with others and gain the approval of those around us. So if our strategies can tap into that fundamental motivation, they're likely to be successful as well. And finally, all of us generally want to behave in ways, or at least be given the chance to act in ways that allow us to feel good about ourselves. We're motivated to see ourselves in a positive light and live up to our self-ascribed traits and our commitments. So let me give you one example of how we can trigger each of these motivations in turn. The first concerns this idea of accuracy. Now, one of the challenges we have in this modern information overloaded world is being able to make quick, efficient decisions. And sometimes the way we do that is not pay attention to what's being said, but rather use the person that's delivering the information, the messenger, as a proxy for a good decision. Let me give you an example from a study that we conducted in London a few years ago with real estate agents. We found that a real estate agent can do one thing that instantly increases their effectiveness and instantly increases the impact on their business. And that's to arrange for their expertise to be introduced in the moment before they deliver a proposition. We tested this in a telephone situation when customers phoned an agency and said, I'm interested in selling my house. We instructed re receptionists before they routed the call through to the agent to simply give them a piece of truthful information about why that realtor was an expert. And the impact was immediate and impressive. A 20% increase in the number of confirmed appointments and a 16% increase in the number of signed contracts compared to control conditions where they weren't introduced. And this I think is a really neat, simple example of the accuracy motivation. We point out that this information is coming from an expert before the expert delivers it. And you can see there that people use that as a useful cue. It unleashes that motivation to want to do the right thing. It seems like the accurate thing to do. Let's talk about the connection motivation. Remember, all of us are motivated to behave in ways that allow us to connect with and gain the approval of others. Here's an example that proves the impact of doing that. It concerns some studies that were done in tax offices where people were sent letters asking them to submit their tax returns and pay their dues. Typically, most tax offices have this policy of pointing out to people that if they fail to submit their returns by a given day and time, they'll be fined. Let's say it's $100. In these studies, we added a sentence to the top of the letters that honestly points out that the previous year, most people submit their tax returns on time. And by providing that piece of information, which essentially, if you think about it, is the trigger to connection, here's what others like you are doing, we were able to measure an immediate increase in the number of people that submitted their returns by a given time and day. We actually went one stage further in these studies, and we didn't just provide information about what most people in, say, the UK do. We also provided information to another group of recipients about what the people that lived in the same postcode or zip code or regional area as them did. That actually had an even bigger effect. Now, 79% of people respond by a given day compared to the two-thirds in the control condition. And when we named the town, that self-identifying connection, the biggest impact of all. So here's an example of how connecting your message, aligning your strategy that enables people to see that this is the connected thing to do, and I'll gain the approval of others by doing it, a very, very powerful strategy for affecting change. And finally, the third of our fundamental motivations is the ego motivation, this idea that all of us in the main are generally motivated to be seen in a positive light. We want to act and behave in ways that allow us to be seen in that positive light. We live up to our self-ascribed traits and our commitments. Here's a study that I like that really demonstrates this neatly. It was a study that was done during Halloween where neighbors put out trays of candies for kids that are dressed up during Halloween to help themselves to. And there was a rule. Kids were told, 
take one candy bar from the tray. Don't take any more, just one for each child. Now, we know what kids are like. They like to bend the rules a little bit. And so what they often found was as many as a third of children would actually break the rules. They'd go up to the candy tray, they'd take a handful rather than just the one that was the rule. When the researchers, however, placed a mirror behind the tray of candy, so that as the kids approached the tray, they could see a reflection of themselves. That reflection of themselves and the potential denting it would have on their ego, now they're being seen as breaking the rules, had a dramatic effect on dishonesty. So I like this study as an example of triggering this idea of ego, providing context in environments that allow people to feel good about themselves, that they're doing the right thing. So there are two simple models from behavioral science, this idea of fast and slow thinking and this idea of fundamental motivations that might be useful to you in the coming days as you think about strategies that you can create that influence and affect change. Of course, these aren't the only ones. In fact, human behavior is a pretty complex subject, which is why we go into a huge amount of detail uh, and depth on our programs at Columbia Business School. Here's uh, an example of the typical applied process that we use at school to uh, teach these insights. We don't just teach about these engines and these system types of thinking, which is that middle component of what you can see here on the screen. We also talk about how you can understand specifically how behaviors come about. A lot of behaviors come about rather than being thought about. So we teach you about how you can understand the intricacies of how behavior happens. So it gives you a really good deep insight into the types of behavior you're looking to change. And finally, we teach you also about how to test and put different strategies into the field that you can experiment with in your business. So you can start to learn for yourself which insights from behavioral science, what interventions, what strategies are going to work best for you. And it's this kind of approach that we apply to all of our applied work. So let's go back to those three challenges that I set out at the beginning of our time together. The transport operator that needs to reduce the number of near misses and accidents amongst its drivers, because not only is it a big safety issue, it's a litigation issue as well that can cost hundreds of millions of dollars each year. The climate change organization that wants to encourage pro-environmental behaviors, like getting people to choose greener options, reducing their energy consumption, their emissions, and eliminating animal trafficking. And finally, the debt management company that wants to persuade customers to agree and stick to affordable payment plans. Here's how we applied our full cycle approach to behavioral science to address each of these ideas in turn. <clears throat> Here's the first, the bus operator study that we conducted in upstate New York in Nassau County, in fact, uh, with 500 bus drivers. One of the things that we found out was that bus drivers are actually incentivized to drive carefully. And one of the proxies for safe driving is the distance that they leave between the front of their vehicle and the car or vehicle that's moving in front. The standard best practice is a three second following distance that's been shown in studies to re drastically reduce the number of near misses, heavy braking, these kind of things. And so bus drivers were incentivized uh, to follow this safe driving distance. Uh, they were paid $100 at the end of the month if they were able to do that, as evidenced by videos in the cabs. Um, now, one of the things that we actually know about incentives is that, yes, incentives are wonderful things for getting people to change their behavior. But incentives and their effectiveness are driven by psychological mechanisms. And one of the things that we know from a lot of behavioral science research is that people in the main generally prefer smaller, more frequent incentives than they do larger ones that occur over a length of time. And so one of our experiments, we decided to test the impact of instead of paying drivers monthly, what if we paid them an equivalent amount weekly? So rather than $100 a month, let's pay them $25 a month. And what we found is that it had an instant impact in compliance to that three-second driving rule. Within the first month, a 23% increase in safe driving metrics, but here was the problem. 
At month four, it had pretty much regressed back to the mean. It had gone back to how it normally was. So it seems like the incentive had the equivalence of a sugar hit. It worked beautifully in the early stages and then rapidly declined in effectiveness. But then one of the things that we decided to think about was this idea of people typically paying more attention to things that they stand to lose than things that they stand to gain. So we wondered what would happen if instead of saying to drivers, if you drive safely this month, we'll give you $100 at the end of the month, what would happen if instead we gave the bus drivers the 100 bucks up front and said, we anticipate you're gonna drive safely this month. And if you fail to do so at the end of the month, maybe we kind of claw some of that money back. And so that's the experiment we did. And here now we find a similar level of uptake in terms of compliance. So that increased compliance was roughly about the same as the uh, smaller, more frequent incentive. But look at the sustainability this time. We were able to maintain that compliance to the safe following distance by adopting this reverse strategy. Now, what about these climate change organizations? What can insights from behavioral science do to help their endeavors? Well, one of the things that we know is that, and you would have seen this from the connectedness study I showed you with the, the tax letters, is that all of us are motivated to follow what others are doing, to be connected to others and to gain their approval. And this can have sometimes a backfiring effect when it comes to shaping and influencing behavior. Because if we learn that many other people are doing something that is actually perhaps undesirable, we can actually unintendedly increase the number of people that are doing that undesirable thing. We find it in littering. Littering typically congregates in littered places. We find it in tax if we point out that Lots of people failed to submit their tax returns last year, even more failed to reply and submit their tax returns the following year. We find it in energy as well, when homeowners are given reports about how their energy consumption compares to their neighbors, those that are using more energy will typically the following month fall in line and use less energy. Yet those that are using less energy have a little bit of a heating party, they actually use more. And one of the things that we're finding in our research, I actually have a team that is currently running pro-environmental and animal trafficking experiments across Southeast Asia at this moment in time. And what we're finding is that past campaigns that these researchers, have, uh, that, that these groups have actually put into place that highlight the increased losses of animal species due to human demand frequently increase the problem. And as I suggested a few moments ago, the same is true of energy consumption. Because of this idea of, well, if everyone else is doing it, it's kind of easier for us to do it as well. It's kind of like, well, if everyone else steals a pen from the office, it's a kind of okay if I do it as well. And what we're finding in our research at the moment is that it's far, far more effective when trying to address these issues, these big climate change pro-environmental issues, is to point out the desirable behavior of what many are people doing, rather than the minority of behaviors that we don't want people to do. So anyone that sees those campaigns that talk about the loss of species, the increased losses due to these kind of impacts of human behavior, they tend generally to be rather ineffective. And so what we're finding in our research is it's much, much better to go with the majority view, the legitimate majority view. And finally, what about this debt management organization? Well, in this particular case, we got an opportunity to experiment with a whole range of different behavioral insights and identify what are the most important factors in any engagement between a bank or a financer or a debt manager and their client. And we found through a variety of different experiments that we actually did that there are four things that are really, really important. First is people are much, much more inclined to engage with an organization that they have similarities with. And so we found that if call center staff were able to highlight similarities they had with a customer in the early stages of an interaction, that led to a much more effective account. Secondly, people are much more likely to move in your direction if you do something for them first. We found in these experiments that if the debt manager actually immediately upon engagement with a client stopped any accruing interest on their debt, people were much more likely to engage with them and commit to a payment plan.
We also found that those people that were focusing their attention on a higher purpose, what it would mean to them to be debt-free, were much, much more likely to engage. And those that actually created a public commitment to pay back their debts were much, much more likely over the longer term to pay their commitments back. And we actually put those four behavioral insights into a set of interactions that we then tested across call center staff. And what we found as a result of implementing these four insights was a very, very healthy uplift in the percentage of people that actually engaged with that organization and negotiated a payment plan and stuck to it. A 27% increase in terms of monetary return, it was worth 45 million pounds a year. So that's about 60 odd million dollars per year. And to assure you that this wasn't just a strategy to get people to pay more, but actually was done in the context of a good relationship the Institute for Customer Services also ranked this company, the debt manager, as significantly higher in terms of customer loyalty and customer service than the banks that they were actually procuring the debt from. So that's a pretty extraordinary set of outcomes from an organization that is typically not seen in the best possible light by consumers. And so in summary, um, thank you very much indeed for your attention. Um, I'm going to summarize by saying lots of the challenges that we face in business aren't necessarily going to be fixed by changing policy or processes, but rather by changing behaviors. And so therefore, designing strategies and plans in our business that go with the grain of how people are most likely to behave seems eminently sensible. And perhaps that's why more and more organizations are turning to the tools and approaches that behavioral science offers us to do exactly that, um, to be able to employ these insights in meaningful, usable, ethical, and effective ways. It does seem to be at this moment in time, uh, the golden era for behavioral science where more and more organizations are turning to it. And so with that in mind, thank you very much indeed for your attention. I'm gonna turn back to Scott now and I think uh, maybe take a few questions. Absolutely, thank you very much, Stephen. Ton of great information. We also received, as always, a lot of great questions. I'm gonna, we're at 11.57 now, uh, East, East Coast time, but I think I'm gonna push us a few extra minutes if you don't mind, Steve, because sure. I'll get to as many of these questions as possible. So I'm gonna combine two of them. I'm gonna kick this off with um, Sheetal and uh, Nancy have asked, basically around the same realm of dealing with behavioral science, implementing behavioral science in the realm of cultural differences and, you know, uh, multicultural international environments like what are your some tips you have for that yeah i think it's a really good question it's a really important one it's increasingly uh, a big part of our work and our research the first thing i would actually say though is that these motivations i'm talking about these ways of thinking the way our brain reacts to information incentives these different types of strategies they're universal across all cultures they are characteristics of the human condition rather than the cultural condition. So I would consider these aspects, these motivations, these engines of change as first order effects. So my advice would be always think about those first and then attend to the nuances of culture. And there, there's lots and lots of research that suggests that, I mean, typically in the main, the further east and south that you go on the planet, the more collective cultures tend to be. So they're probably more inclined or primed to respond to those aspects of connectedness. What, what's in it for my community, my, my town, my, my nation? They take a more collective view. Whereas typically, and I'm using the words advisedly, this is not a hard and fast rule, the further north and west we go in society, the more individualistic cultures tend to be. So they're probably more thinking about what's right for me. You know, what, what, what is gonna be the individualistic kind of aspect here? So you might wanna think about that in the context of which of these triggers and which of these motivations you want to activate to affect some sort of change. So think about that in the context of collective cultures and individualistic cultures. There's also, um, those of you that are kind of read around this, area. There's the Hofstetter's work on power indices across countries. Certain cultures are more willing to accept a, a more kind of authoritarian diktat. Others are a lot more democratic. So you can put that into the mix as well. But my general response, Scott, is these are 
principles of the human condition. So we should think about those first and then add on those cultural nuances second. Okay, great, great. So uh, to burrow down a little even deeper, Yulia asks, how do you suggest using the concept of fast and slow thinking to influence stakeholders to support change? So those two different types of, of uh, thinking. Yeah. So I, I think, first of all, um, the, the, the question there is exactly framed in the right order, fast first, then slow. I think that is the first answer. It gives us a bit of direction. I mean, one of the things that we talk about on the program and that I talk about more generally is that really the currency of successful influence these days is attention. Um, if you don't have attention, you really have nothing. And one of the things that our brain does remarkably is, is it kind of assigns importance to those things that we're paying attention to. And so it does kind of seem to me to be sensible to think about what are the attention capturing ways in which we can engage audiences first. And that really does speak to that domain of fast thinking first, that system one type of thinking. Um, often that might be uh, a conundrum or a surprise or a, an interesting pit of research that's kind of counter to what the perceived wisdom actually is, or maybe a mystery even. So couching your proposition in the context of a mystery or something that needs to be sold that draws people in, that speaks to that kind of fast thinking part of the brain first is really, really important. And then, you know, using that more rational, ponderous set of slower thinking to provide the rationale afterwards. One of the things I've noticed is, is that typically we think that in order to change people's behavior, we have to change their minds first. And so we have to overwhelm them with information. But there's lots and lots of examples in everyday life where people's behavior doesn't match their beliefs about things. In fact, actually, I, I'm starting to think that the, the direction is it going in the other way. We kind of change our beliefs in the moment to match how we're behaving in a given moment in time. So, you know, I, I, I think this whole idea of change minds first and behaviors follow, we probably need to forget about that and just focus typically on capturing attention and behaving and, and changing behaviors first. And for some people, their minds will catch up. And so that order of fast first, then slow seems to be uh, the way to go there. Do you think that that is because of massive information in our lives as opposed to 30 years ago where you could maybe have a more definite view of your belief system? I think it absolutely is. I mean, even 20 years ago when I first started working in this field, we could probably count quite accurately the number of messages, appeals, vice for information that a typical, say, US or European or Indian or Australian citizen would be exposed to in a given day. It could be a couple of thousand. We're at the point where we just can't count them anymore. In fact, what we're doing is we're, we're measuring them in, in feet and inches as we're scrolling down our phones. Well, so right, we, we right. do. We, we don't. This idea that we, all of us, you know, if you ask people, you know, do you think you sh you, 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 you'd like more information about this? People say, yeah, of course I want more information. They think that information is power. But the fact that we're providing information, you know, don't, don't fall into a, you know, that kind of, disbelief that because you're giving people information, they're actually relying on it, they're paying attention to it. They, they probably are not. And so I think you're exactly right. You know, as, as we talk about now, this VUCA world, this volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world, and, and all that more information does, and often competing information, depolarizing information, is just amplify that environment even more. So I think, yeah, uh, <laughs> as more and more information becomes available, we're yeah. using less and less of it to determine some of our most important life decisions. Right, yeah, exactly. I just thought it was an interesting fact. All right, so I wanna talk about a few questions that come in on the differences of behavioral science when applied to B to B and B to C. Can you yeah. talk about that? Yeah, I think it's a really useful um, distinction to actually make. One of the things I think that behavioral science does really, really well um, because we talk about behavior and we define a behavior, is we can target interventions at a specific individual's behavior or lots and lots of people doing the same thing. It does become a little bit more complex in that kind of business to business environment because what we're doing is we're trying to influence an, an entity rather than an individual identity. So for example, I can, I can share with the group the fact that those same studies that work brilliantly to encourage people to pay their taxes on time don't work so well when you use the same strategy to encourage businesses to pay their taxes on time. Because the target of your inter intervention in that instance is, is probably spread amongst a number of people or departments. 
So we need, in those instances, to start thinking about the insights that behavioral science can provide in terms of how groups think or how departments act or how people work in unity. So there are going to be strategies that you can use for B to C, but they're not necessarily going to be the same as those that you would use in a B to B environment. So you know, that, again, it's to that left side of the model that we teach at school, which is that idea of not just being clear about the behaviors that you're looking to influence, but the individuals or the groups and their makeup that you're targeting your interventions at. And they, just because something works to an individual doesn't necessarily mean it will work for a group and vice versa. Right. And starting with fast thinking first. Yeah. That's, you know, that order. Yeah. So, um, again, you know, I, I, we could spend all day talking about this. I know I know we're excited. Your program, uh, uh, Behavioral Science and Business Program, live online program, I believe you start next Monday, right? Correct? That's right. Yeah. 9 a.m. Eastern First. next Monday. So good luck with that. What I'd like to do now, though, is I want to keep this energy going uh, for everybody. There's a lot of people, you know, in, in, in the room with us now. I'd like to ask what I always ask at the end of the webinars, which is, what should someone do today, tomorrow? There's a lot of long range thinking here. But I'd also like to know, what can someone do today to keep that energy going, to share it with someone else in their organization? Yeah. Okay, so first is, remember that you don't have to necessarily change people's minds to change their behaviors. And so any situation, Scott, where you are going into a situation where you want to influence a behavior, get some sort of change affected. Yes, think about the information you're going to convey. Yes, think about perhaps the incentives that you might use. But then pause and ask yourself the additional question, which is, how can I introduce this kind of idea of behavioral thinking into presenting my incentives and my information such that it goes with the grain of how people are most likely to behave? Don't just rely on the information or the incentives alone, but think about them as those two legs of a stool, and this third leg is to think about the way in which our reactions to, inf uh, to, to information and incentive are shaped by these psychological principles. So pause, I think, is the thing you can do. Pause, slow down your thinking, and ask yourself the question, how could one of these motivations that we talked about today help me here? Yeah, it's a... Uh... Sounds like the communication theory of audience analysis, right? You know, you before you do the actual communication. So thank you so much. Uh, I wish you well on your program next week. Thank everyone for joining us today. On behalf of Columbia Business School Executive Education, Steve and myself, we wish you well. Have a good day. Cheerio, everyone.